Hey everybody, it's John Weecroft here with another Sunday Q&A. We're up to the milestone mark of number 40 this week. So uh, we've got some great questions. Uh, I'm going to start with a tune, as usual. And this week I'm going to play the Bebop Classic Move. Now, what I do with these tunes is I often use them as uh, my vehicles for practice during the week. It's one of the reasons why I select certain pieces. And this particular one is uh, going to be involved in one of those collaborative projects on Facebook. That, uh, that have become quite prevalent during lockdown with the amazing guitarist Ant Law and an equally amazing bass player Mark Rose. So at the moment, this is a work in progress. So this is my rhythm guitar part. And Mark Rose has put his bass part down. It's absolutely fantastic, as is always the case. So what I'm doing is I'm using this as a form of practice. I've done a kind of an abridged version of the form so that I can kind of get my thing together, use it to audition some ideas. And it's good to have a little bit of pressure sometimes because it sort of makes you, gives you focus and makes you get it, get it together for a particular purpose, rather than it's so uh, easy, particularly in lockdown, to put things off. And motivation can sometimes be lacking if you haven't got a specific purpose for why do you need to do certain things. I find I suffer from that, actually. I usually need to have a specific thing in mind when I'm practicing. So that's one of the things that I use these Sunday Q&As for. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to just do my usual three takes that's something I stick to that pretty firmly, to be fair, uh, because once again, that same thing of uh, when, if you are the effectively the engineer and the performer, one of the problems of being able to record things yourself as opposed to going into a recording studio is that you can take infinite numbers of takes. Uh, there's usually not a specific amount of time, uh, whereas in a studio, of course, the clock is ticking and there may be other... Uh, other musicians waiting to get in after you and things like that. So therefore, it tends to polarize um, and certainly, certainly motivate you and make you kind of get it together in a specific period of time. So I find if I say to myself, three takes and that's it, I'm gonna pick the best one, whether it's perfect or not. You know, In case there's, of course, if there's a real kind of obvious mistake or something that I'm not getting down, then maybe that's an indication I need to do more practice beforehand. But I limit myself to three complete takes, pick the best one. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I hope I managed to play a good take in three takes. And I'll see you on the other side of the chair. <laughs> Thank you. 
a great question from Rory relating to how you break through certain plateaus in your playing when approaching speed, trying to get things up to speed. And if I had any thoughts as to strategy that you could use for getting things up to speed. Um, so I'm going to share you some thoughts that I think I learned this or read this first in uh, Kenny Werner's excellent book, um, Effortless Mastery, that's the one, uh, where he talks about, uh, I think it comes from neuro-linguistic programming, it's one of those kind of uh, sports science type approaches, I think, uh, where they use a model based upon a triangle. So you imagine a triangle with three points of three different things that you can... Uh, that you can sacrifice when you're trying to get something up to speed. And the first one, the first corner of the triangle, which is the one that we generally use as our go-to thing, if we're trying to get a specific thing up to speed, is the actual tempo. Okay, so say I take uh, the head to move that I just played, that's pretty fast, it's 250. Uh, this particular version is a 250. So I'm gonna use my archaic metronome, which won't do 250, I see it'll do 252. Um, and I'm going to have the metronome on half, so I'm going to be 126. So that's going to be my target tempo. So maybe I'll start off by playing it a little bit reduced. So you might go there, in this case, 200. Let's see, can you play? Okay, so the tricky part there in that phrase is the string crossing. this phrase so it's possible that you could instead of necessarily bringing the speed down you could think about reducing the length of the phrase so that would be the second corner so I guess the first and most obvious thing is to reduce the tempo and then gradually bring the tempo up the problem with this is sometimes you never get the sensation of feeling what does it feel like when it's played faster and you might find that when you play things at speed, you make subtle adjustments and you do things in a slightly different way. You might hold the pick slightly differently. You might use different fingerings. Anything could change. The pick strokes could change. Just even down to the kind of the angle of the pick on the string might change when you play things fast. So one thing you can do is not necessarily reduce the speed per se, but you can just reduce how much of the phrase that you're working on. So instead of playing the whole thing, we might just take this bit. Here's this up at 250. So I'm just taking a little bit. doing is reducing the phrase so instead of playing the whole I'm just going to play or maybe little bits of it so that's maybe the second thing that we can sacrifice so imagine we've got our triangle again so speed we can slow things down so when practicing something one approach is to slow it down and then gradually speed it up over a period of time. So that would be you know, taking this at 200 metronome, clicking at one. And I'll play the first part. And then when you're comfortable with that, moving it up a little bit. So now it's at 111. One, two. One, two, one, two, three, four. Okay, and then you get comfortable there. Then you bring up to now 240 or 120. Click on two and four. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. Part there. 
So on, so just take a little bit of the of the phrase. So some of, of our practice can be reducing the speed and gradually bringing the speed up. Other parts can be, instead of playing the whole, in this case, whatever that is, however many bars that phrase is, just taking maybe a little small piece of it, maybe the first bar or the first half a bar and trying to get that up to speed. And the thing with that is, is you're getting a sensation of what it feels like to actually play at that tempo. So that can be a useful thing. Um, now, the third thing that you could sacrifice is either you could say, well, let's just play it up to speed and try and play the whole thing. And let's just see where we're at and allow ourselves the luxury of being able to make a few mistakes or play slightly sloppily. Now, a lot of the time we're uncomfortable with this because we think, oh, if you practice sloppily, then you're going to play sloppily. Or, you know, if you allow yourself to make a mistake, then, you know, you know Lord forbid that you might make a mistake when you play. Well, well, you know, this isn't... Um, this is not about not acknowledging when you're making mistakes or when areas are not right. It's about figuring out when that's going to happen. It's like stress testing something, just seeing like where are the seam, when's the seam going to rip? You know, at what stage? Where is the the problem here? If there's going to be an issue with this piece, what is the problem? And sometimes what I allow myself to do when trying to get something up to speed is I just think, well, just go for it, and then just keep my eyes open. And listen back and see what are the areas that need work because then you know what areas you need to practice the most so i find allowing myself that luxury of just to go for it or maybe even increase the speed so that you get to the stage where you know we want to find out where the wheels fall off shall we say so if we look at this triangle again we've got on one corner we've got speed so that's something that we can sacrifice so play the whole piece the whole head the whole whatever it is but just play it at a reduced tempo and gradually bring the speed up. And that's one aspect of practice, okay? Then the second thing will be, maybe we find the tempo that, we, that we're happy with and we're just gonna practice little bits of the piece in sort of bursts. It's a bit like running in bursts. And if, you wanna, if you're into running and you wanna get faster, perhaps a good way to do it is to just run short distances, but at a faster speed and then build up stamina as opposed to building up speed per se. Because sometimes that's the issue. The issue isn't necessarily speed per se. It's stamina, it's doing it consistently. So do it in short bursts and then increase. So maybe a beat and then two beats and four beats and so on and, and increase it, uh, the duration that way. So we've got speed, duration, that's another thing that we can sacrifice. You could also sacrifice, and I would include this kind of with duration, things like the dynamic level. You might find you can play it faster but not loud. You know, and so what you might have to do is play lightly. When, when I find if I go to a new speed level, sometimes what I have to do is bring the dynamics down as well because to play with velocity, to play with attack takes greater energy. So of course to play that faster requires more stamina. So that's really duration is to do with stamina, I guess. Okay, and then the third thing is accuracy. So meaning like let's just maybe to end a practice session, but just run it at the tempo that you want it to be at. You know, So I've done that with this particular tune in practicing it, you know, it's 250. I would practice it, put it into transcribe where you can slow tracks down and whatnot, or play with a metronome at a different speed and bring it up in tempo over an extended period of time. But then you get to the stage then when I would say, well, okay, I'm going to leave the tempo where it's at. And then I'm going to play, like, instead of playing consistently, I might just dip in and play little short bursts of notes. The same applies with improvising through changes as well. I might play through this at the 250 tempo but not necessarily play on every chord, you know, play some lines and then leave some pauses, leave some rests, those kind of things. So what's inside the triangle though, what's not gonna give, like things that I'm not prepared to sacrifice are things like good posture. Uh, so just to achieve a certain speed level, I'm not prepared to risk injury by adopting some kind of technique that's gonna create damage. So that's something that I would think would be a a kind of a compromise too far. So that's something that I, I tend not to uh, to compromise on, as it were, or, or tend not to bend on. So if it means uh, the, to achieve that speed limit, but by introducing tension in the short term, it's kind of a bit of a false economy. So I guess we have to, as well as all these things that I'm talking about, remember to try not to tense up, remember to try to, to uh, remember to breathe, which is another thing you notice when players are trying to play things that's right at the edge of their comfort um, level. Very often we tend to do things like tense up and hold our breath. So a kind of an unrelated 
or seemingly unrelated way I deal with this, but it seems to really help is if I find for me, tension for me on guitar personally manifests itself in gripping things harder. If I feel tense, usually something like the pick, right? So there's two things that you can do to stop this from being a problem. The first of which is make certain that you choose a pick that's not slippy. So I find on electric guitar, um, these gator grip things, I think that's what they're called, uh, or similar. And on solid body guitars, I generally use one of these ones. Jim Dunlop, I think that's a Jim Dunlop as well. Uh, on acoustic guitar, I use a Killy Nonis. Um, I don't know if they've got a name, I think they've got a name, but they're Gypsy Jazz Picks and they're absolutely fantastic because, well, A, they sound brilliant, but secondly, the, the principal reason why I really like them is because they've got an embossed pattern on them, which is really, really, uh, it's really easy to hold on to. So you don't need to hold the pick tight to stop it from moving in your hand. And that manifests itself as a lack of tension in the picking hand, which is a really, really good thing. So there's that. So that's the first thing is what's the pick made out of? I used to do things like drill holes in them and stuff like that before I discovered these ones where you actually stick to them quite a bit. Uh, and then uh, the second thing is in between phrases, I find if I get tense in any way, I take my thumb off the back of the pick and that is almost like a pressure valve. If I can feel that there's any tension happening, I, I force myself to do it at times. I just go, okay, let go, you know, and I can feel the steam come out of it. It feels like as if any kind of, like, you know, like almost like holding your shoulders if you feel tense and relax your shoulders. That for me achieves a similar thing. So this is something that I'll do in between if I'm doing that burst practice idea. Something that I'll do in between is I'll take my thumb off the pick. So I hope those things help. I would check out Effortless Mastery by Kenny Werner. It's a really, really great book for many different things on many levels. But that's something that I took from that. So this idea of a triangle. So in my practice session, I'll use all strategies. So that's an important thing. I don't think any one of those strategies is the only way to go and is perfect in and of itself. So if you practice by slowing things down, sometimes you hit that plateau and you can never get it beyond. So that's great for certain things. It's really, really good. And I maybe begin with that. Then what I'll do is I'll achieve the tempo or, or aim to achieve the tempo, but just in a very, very small way, like maybe just a few notes, four notes at that tempo. That's good for building confidence. Because then if you can play a beat of the phrase that you want to play at the tempo, then you realize then it's a question of just continuing. Because if you can play one beat, you can play two beats. And if you can play two beats, you can play a whole bar. And if you can play a whole bar, you can play four bars. And on and on it goes. You learn it in pieces and build up stamina. So sometimes speed, it's not about the technique to play fast. It's about have you got the stamina to play it consistently. So that's where you break it into small pieces. So the second part would be speed. Second one is duration. Now, what I usually end the practice session with is that thing where I want to see the stress test, as it were, where I'll allow the accuracy. I'll allow myself that option of just playing and just seeing how the chips fall and then listen back to that or listen as I'm playing. And I'll record it as well very often. And then I'll listen back. And now we can all video ourselves as well very easily. So I'd suggest maybe you could even video yourself and watch it back. And then I know where to begin on the next practice session because I've seen clearly which aspects work, which aspects don't work, what needs the, um, the most uh, attention. Now, the other thing that's important to bear in mind as well with all of these things is when you come back to stuff, which is why it's a great idea to practice these kind of things in little pieces and bursts rather than one mammoth session, because you might convince yourself that you can do something because you can play it at the end of a practice session. And the problem with that, of course, is that's how you're playing with kind of however long the practice session is, say it's half an hour. That's how well you play a thing with half an hour to warm up on that idea. Uh, and of course, the problem with that is when you come back to do it the next time or you, you try to use that idea in a performance, which is what this is all about, then you haven't had that half hour of warming up and gradually, very sort of over a period of time, refining your aim you know, so that it ends up being together, but then when you come back at it the next time, it's nowhere near as together. Uh, so I would suggest what you should do is once you've actually physically warmed up, right, come back at stuff right, and see how well do you play it right at the start. Like uh, what um, Dave Allred in, in The Pressure Principle calls match conditions, you know, so he gives the analogy of a rugby player 
uh, Johnny Wilkinson, I think, you know, doing practicing try kicking, you know, kicking the ball through the goal. But and he was hit, hitting it brilliantly after he'd had like six or seven attempts because each time he uh, refines his aim and he gets to, get to the extent that he's getting every single one through the posts, you know. Uh, but then in a match, he doesn't doesn't have six or seven attempts to get his aim in. He's got to be able to do a first time. So what he suggested which I think is a great idea and I adopt this with my own practice, is like a form of like circuit practicing. If you're working on four things, you might spend a few minutes on the first thing, a few minutes on the second, a few minutes on the, the next and to the fourth and then come back to the first again. Because then you see how well do you play something when it's the first attempt at playing that idea. Of course, this is something that you could maybe do once you've got an idea down. Right. If you're in the initial stages of learning, then of course you need to stick with stuff for a little while. But say it's something that you, you're basically at the stage of incorporating it into your performance, you need to be able to do it first time. If I think of a musical idea in an improvisational situation, I have to be able to play it first time. I can't take tangos. It's not possible. Recording, maybe you can get away with it. But you know, I'd like to be able to play what I can play pretty much first time and get it right. So that's worth thinking about. As a little additional thought there, just you may or may not have noticed that I actually played the melody line slightly differently when I played it at different speeds. So one way I played a roll, like, like so, up and down. And when I played it slow, I went, choices there now I mention this because I didn't really consciously think about that you know it's only when I uh, I played the melody at different tempos that I realized oh, I've got these two different ways and I wasn't even really that aware of the fact that I was changing these things so be cautious about the fact that you might be doing that too when you play something at one tempo you're gonna play it one way when you play it at a different tempo you may find that you subconsciously change it to something else now Whilst it's fine in a performance situation to keep your options open, it's also good to just pay attention and be aware that you may or may not be doing these kind of things. So just to be clear, the two different options are, so we were, um, option one or Here's a super simple exercise inspired by a conversation with Adrian um, relating to independence of parts within fingerstyle technique. So I've got this really simple exercise I'd like to share with you where we move a simple melody to different registers. So in the treble, in the middle, or in the bass. At the same time as we play this eighth note melody, we're going to play a quarter note bass line. So like this kind of feel. So the fingers are moving at twice the rate of the bass, so of the thumb. Now we're going to look at this with hybrid picking as well in a moment. So just with finger style technique, I'm alternating between the index and middle finger. I'm using free strokes here rather than rest strokes, but it's your call. You can choose to use rest strokes if you will. Okay, and then once we've got this together, of course you can play a more elaborate melody. But just for the purposes of clarity, let's keep it simple. And I'm gonna flip it round. So now the melody is in the bass. Again, of course, you can play a more elaborate melody, but let's just stick to our three notes. Ascending and descending bass. Flip. So it's moving from the treble to the bass there. Now we can put this in the middle. So instead of it being um, on the high string or the low string, it's maybe on the D string. 
ostinato can be below or above. What combination? So the idea here is we can move the attention of the focus from the treble to the bass to the middle again as I say I'm using this really really simple melody just as a teaching device of course you could uh, replace this with anything you could play the melody to a standard but in the bass it doesn't always have to be in the treble okay so that's our first thing is to do this with fingerstyle technique we can repeat the exact same procedure but with hybrid picking now what's going to happen here is for the most part any of the melody notes or as many notes as i can possibly play i'm going to play with the pick just using picking fingers when it's absolutely necessary so when we do our Each alternate bass note, of course, will be with the pick, or, or every bass note will be with the pick, sorry. Each alternate treble note will be going between the pick and fingers. Like so, and that allows me to get the most tone, the most uh, drive, with not playing with nails. Same deal. Or. So this is a tricky one where we go. So three of the four notes. Only this first note. Is pick and fingers. the melody notes that is of course so we have uh, the low bass notes and the finger then the finger that's uh, the pick sorry the pick with the finger so the melodies all with the exception of that first note being played with the pick and fingers so this concept of using the pick wherever possible is really really uh, uh, helpful in terms of tone uh, we can use this idea of the pick and fingers using the fingers to reach across as a means of crossing strings. That's kind of a useful pick and finger technique. Let me show you this thing. So this is a, an approach I got from uh, watching Brett Garsed play. So Brett will of, often reach across for a new note with the finger because it allows him to make a string transition quicker and then the pick follows a little bit later on. So instead of going to play an octave, he might go then the finger and then the pick follows. Let me break that motion down for you really, really slowly. So what we have here is the pick on the note D, then the middle finger plays the octave and then the pick follows. So it's down, finger, down. And we can make that into a semi-quaver type idea. sent me a question asking about Wes Montgomery's guitar style specifically chord melody and also just a brief introduction into octaves so I'm going to begin by showing you a little chord melody idea that you can hear Wes use frequently uh, it's based around the idea of connecting up some small four notes inversions of drop two chords 
So we're going to do this in the key of D minor. And our four voicings will be so D minor with the root as the lowest note and with the minor third as the highest. That's D minor six, that is, of course. You can play D minor seven if you like. It's as well. a nice voicing. Okay, and then we have D minor seven you can play here. Or D minor six. Which Wes particularly likes that one. I use, use, use that one a lot because it could also double up as a G9. Asking this. Okay. Uh, but it's useful to know the minus seven to minus six. In every instance as well. So minus seven to minus six. And then minus seven to minus six. Okay. So let's just plumb for the minus six. For now. So there's our first voice in. Second with the minor third as the lowest note and the perfect fifth is the highest. Then with the fifth as the lowest note and the sixth is the highest. And then with the sixth as the lowest note and the tonic. So, so first off, we can use these things as D minor. We can also use them as like a G9 sound. Okay, so there's our inversions, or voicings if you prefer. Even though these could be classified as inversions, because of the fact that the bass note isn't necessarily played by the guitar player in this instance because he's a high voice and it's more of a chord melody thing. The bass player could still be playing reposition, just a straight D tonic note. You know? So I think of these more as voicings than inversions. So an inversion really implying when the bass note changes. <clears throat> okay, so what Wes does is he connects these D minor voicings. D minor six voices, and he moves to each of them with its five chord. So that's like going. A7 to D minor. So we could go, uh, so we could use A7 in four inversions if you wish, and that could be like so. Um, there's the four inversions for A7, so with the root and the bass third on the top, or the seventh in the bass and the root on the top, fifth, seventh, or three and five. So at this stage you might be, if you're not familiar with these voicings, I might suggest that you get clued up with drop two voicings. Um, yeah, they're a big part of rhythm guitar, so I would suggest that you spend some time looking at these. But just to give you them, uh, I'll just shout out the fret numbers. So A7 here, two, 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 three. A7 here, five, six, five, five. Then it's seven, nine, eight, nine. Uh, 11, 12, 10, 12. So hopefully you can pause the, uh, the video and get those voices down. So now I can move between them. I can go A7, D minor six, A7, D minor six. A7, D minor 6, A7, D minor 6, A7, D minor 6. And that creates kind of like a scale of chords. That kind of idea uh, where it's ascending through. The only thing is, there's a lot of shapes to memorize there. It's essentially doing that. Okay, so we can simplify this by making one slight modification to our seven chords. So instead of playing an A7, if I put a B flat into these voicings, instead of the A, if I replace the A for a B flat, I get A7 flat nine. And that has the fringe benefit of meaning now that all four of those A7 shapes are identical.
and they look like a diminished chord. So we've got this kind of idea. So what we can do now is we can connect like a ladder, as it were, diminished, minor, diminished, minor, diminished, minor, diminished, minor, diminished, minor. Or we can kind of surround each minor shape with a diminished below and above. So we can go. Okay, so let's just do that one more time. We've got this down. I'll do this with a bass note this time. A7 to D minor. A7 to D minor. A7 flat nine. D minor, A7, D minor, hope this is making sense, A7, D minor. Of course you can, if you so choose, replace these minor sixes with minor sevens, so that. The beauty of the minor six, of course, is that we get this chromatic sort of spaced out approach as opposed to where we go. Or more accurately if it's minus seven it'll be fingers are a bit trickier as well. So when Wes is moving about at speed Six is a little bit easier. It also has that duality, as I mentioned before, where G9, you know, so these chords function as G9. Hope that makes sense. Here's a super simple way to get into playing octaves rather like Wes Montgomery. So one of the differences between the way a jazz player might play octaves and the way that a rock player might play octaves is that the rock player is predominantly concerned with muting. So what that means is, if you listen to someone like Jimi Hendrix, for example, when he plays octaves, he tends to lock into an octave shape and then move along the length of the string. This way, horizontally. And the reason for that is, of course, we want to be able to strum pretty ferociously all the strings and not have any open strings ringing. So that means if we move to different string groups, every time we do this, we're leaving ourselves open to potentially uh, extraneous noise, ringing, open strings, harmonics, feedback, all of those kind of things. So we tend to be a bit more kind of locked into one set of uh, string pairs. So in this case, strings five and three move horizontally along the guitar neck to find our octave shapes. Okay, as opposed to a jazz player might move more uh, vertically within a position. So Wes would move across the guitar neck, resizing the octaves depending upon which string pair that he's concerned with. So if we're in the key of D or D minor in this case, so everything now will be D minor pentatonic. A great thing to practice is to move across the octave shapes going across each pentatonic scale. But rather than play the pentatonic scale like so, two notes per string, we're gonna play it one note per string. There's our four pentatonic notes. We have another four here. We have another four here. So learning the scale in the form of 
lines that go across the neck. And there's one here. So what this means is our D minor pentatonic form here. If I play that using the octave forms, it gives us So what we're going to do, you can use one and three or one and four. One and four is generally preferable because it means the undersides of the fingers can meet the unwanted strings because the third finger being a little bit longer will arch and will miss those other strings out. So the fourth finger, arguably, is the most successful one here. So here's our four shapes. So we have D, G, and then we've got a C and an F. So that's a straight line. Okay. Now if we go to the eighth fret now, it's not quite a straight line to keep it into the pentatonic scale. We'd have a C and an F, and then it goes back to an A and a D. So that's still D minor. Okay. Now of course Wes would play these things with his thumb brushing across the strings. You don't have to do that, of course. You can use a pick. I find what I tend to do to get a sound that's similar to the thumb is I'll flip the pick around. So I'll use the fat part rather than the pointy part to get a smoother sound. But you know, the thumb's available if you wish to use it. Uh, but don't be like me and overdo it and get a big blood blister. Mad Wes Fest, and my my hand let me know about it the next day. Uh, okay, so there's the eighth fret. Then the fifth fret, we're straight line again. A, D, G, and C. Okay, and at the third fret, we've got not quite a straight line. It kinks away on the G string. Three, 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 and two. up an octave to be in D minor, we've got the, uh, the 13th fret, and then a straight line from the 12th. So what we've got now is a series of lines that go across the neck. So here, then up to the 5th fret, then up to the 8th fret, to the 10th, straight, and then up to the 13th, and then 12th. Of course you can connect them together to create these pentatonic, more kind of uh, um, every note of the scale rather than the, the uh, interval jump of a fourth. The idea with this particular exercise is get us used to moving across the neck. So there we have it. So one more time in the key of D minor, our lowest position, three, 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 two. This is the lower, the lower fret notes I'm giving you here. Five, 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 five. Then it's eight, seven, seven, and then all tens, then thirteen, then all twelves, and so on. And you got to be careful that you don't allow any open strings to ring. Now, one of the things that I'm doing here uh, that might be worthy of uh, of mention. You maybe can notice that the tip of my index finger here is touching the string above. So if I do the Wes brush with the thumb, I can kind of catch the string above and that's not going to ring. Of course, if I strum the low E string when I'm up here, then they're going to ring, you know, because you can't mute everything. Uh, but you're not really going to strum all six strings. I would not think if we're actually playing on the top three but you might catch the string above so this finger here is a bit of insurance so that if you were to catch the string above or you were coming from that string 
and you just take your finger off, it's likely that the open string would ring. So we need to use the tip of our finger and the underside to mute. And what ideally what we'd like is that that's not going to ring. Now, of course, as I go towards the treble, I can't do much about the bass strings. It's not this kind of approach. Wes is much more floating. In fact, you can see him doing this kind of thing. So there's no way we can get to those bass strings. But you can get one extra string outside of the range of the octave by using the tip of the first finger. So it's a much more kind of, uh, your fingernails should be pointing outwards, not upwards. It's not a vertical way of fretting the notes. Because if you fret vertically, you're going to get this with an open string. And that we do not want. So that string in the middle is uh, muted by the underside of the first finger. Even maybe a little bit of the tip of the fourth finger, the string above the, the top edge of that first finger takes care of the muting. So that's our exercise. 12th fret, uh, sorry, 10th fret, forgive me. Then we've got 8, 7, 7, 5, 5, 5, 5, 3, 3, 3, 2. We've reached the end of yet another Sunday Q&A. Thanks for getting this far. So that's number 40 in the can. So uh, at this stage now, we've got quite a repository of information. So a lot of questions uh, we've dealt with, but please feel free to, uh, to, to re-ask the same questions if need be. I can always look at the same topics again, hopefully shed new light. Likewise, any fresh ideas or things that I've not looked at, now would be a good time to shout out. I've decided I'm going to do 52 of these. And then we're on to something else. I'm going to move on to something else. I'm getting busy. Things are getting busy. Second album's nearly finished. So I'm going to do this until number 52. So there's going to be another 12 sessions. So I'm on the hunt for questions. I'm on the hunt for requests. Please keep uh, any kind comments coming. Shares are really helpful. Spread the word if you can, if you think anyone might find these useful. Um, all of the previous weeks are all up on YouTube and they're still up on Facebook so you should be able to find them pretty easily but thanks once again hope you're staying safe take care of yourself stay inspired and I'll see you next week for number 41